to appear today? I'm Michael Moore. I'm the CEO of the Public Health Association uh, of Australia. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Canberra. I'm president-elect of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. And as much as I appreciate the promotion to doctor uh, today, uh, I actually don't, uh, haven't earned that title yet. I'm Dr Deborah Gleeson. Um, I'm spokesperson for the Public Health Association of Australia on trade agreements and health. Um, convener of the Political Economy of Health Special Interest Group in the Public Health Association of Australia. And I'm an academic at La Trobe University in Melbourne and my area of re research expertise is trade agreements and their impact on health. Very good. Now, would uh, one of you like to make an opening statement? We will actually start with uh, Dr Gleeson and perhaps I'll add a little bit to it. Uh, okay. We'll try and uh, keep it tight. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to our submission and to provide some input to the committee's inquiry into the Commonwealth's treaty making process. The Public Health Association of Australia has had a long-standing interest in trade and investment agreements and their intersection with health. We believe that health is a human right and that people's health status is impacted by determinants outside the health system and trade agreements are an important um, aspect of those social determinants of health. We have a policy on trade agreements and health which says that trade agreements should not limit or override a nation's ability to foster and maintain systems and infrastructure that contribute to health and wellbeing. Policy space needs to be conserved in trade agreements for regulation to protect public health and trade agreements also need to address environmental sustainability and equity issues within and between countries. Trade agreements can impact on many different areas of healthcare and public health, including access to affordable medicines, equitable provision and quality of health services, the ability of governments to regulate health damaging products such as alcohol, tobacco and processed foods, um, the nutritional status of populations, and access to other social determinants of health like employment and income. So they're a very central um, concern of our membership. And we're particularly concerned about the sort of new emerging breed of trade agreements that go um, well beyond traditional trade areas into um, areas that have previously been matters for domestic policy making. Um, we've been particularly active in advocacy around the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiations. Um, particularly, we became active in that area when we became aware that there were proposals um, for things like expanded intellectual property rights and constraints on the operation of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, proposals that would increase the cost of medicines for both the government and for the community, um, an investor state dispute settlement mechanism allowing foreign corporations to sue governments over their health related policies and laws and also um, a range of other provisions, including um, provisions that could provide greater rights to industry to participate in policy making processes. Um, we recently led a health impact assessment of the proposed TPP, along with um, a large group of academics and health organisations and other uh, community organisations. And this was based primarily on leaked proposals and draft texts and we provided a copy of that um, health impact assessment to the committee. So we looked at, um, in that health impact assessment, at four areas, the cost of medicines, tobacco control policies, alcohol policies and nutrition labelling. And we found, based on the sorts of provisions that have been proposed for the TPP, that there are potential negative impacts in each of those areas. Since we released that health impact assessment report, there's been a leak of a recent draft of the investment chapter of the TPP, um, which has raised further concerns for us. Um, this is the chapter that includes the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. And we were very disappointed to see that the much touted carve outs and safeguards that are supposed to protect health and the environment in this chapter are full of pro problems and loopholes. And uh, I've written about this um, a recent article in the conversation and we also uh, wrote a letter to Minister Rob together with a number of other health organisations um, pointing out some of those issues and we'll be happy to elaborate on them later. Um, we're also very concerned about the potential effects on developing countries, particularly in terms of access to medicines. 
um, and also countries that are less able to fund um, fighting investor state claims in health related areas. In addition to the TPP, we also have concerns about a number of other trade agreements that Australia is involved in negotiating. One of these is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. There was a recent leaked text that shows that some of the same sorts of um, intellectual property provisions that have been proposed for the TPP have also been proposed for RCEP. Um, the Trade in Services Agreement is also of concern to us, particularly proposals around medical tourism and using health insurance funds for that purpose. And also PACER Plus, an agreement with the Pacific Island countries, um, which could have damaging effects on the health systems of, of our Pacific Island neighbours in a range of different areas. And what I would point out is that in each of these cases, um, our concerns have been raised by leaked text. Um, this is often the first um, signal to us that there are issues being discussed in the negotiations that we, are con that we would be concerned about. Um, even with the, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, um, it's had, I think, seven rounds of negotiations um, already, and it was only in February that we obtained um, a leaked uh, draft proposal for that agreement. And, um, became aware that there were issues that, similar issues to the TPP. I'll hand over to Michael. Um, I'll just talk really very quickly about some, about the lack of transparency in the negotiations and how we think the treaty um, making process ought to be changed. Uh, trade agreements these days include many policy issues that go well beyond traditional trade areas and impact on many other areas domestic policy, including health, and not only at the federal level, but also at the state and territory level. The secrecy, the lack of transparency of trade negotiation, we believe represents a serious threat to public health and public interest. Uh, there may be some rationale, we can understand it, uh, for keeping trade negotiations under wraps in the past, uh, when they were primarily about uh, market access and, and bargaining, one can see the sense in that. But now that they've gone so far beyond that, uh, there is a, a need for a much more open process. It's actually extraordinarily difficult to get information on specifics about the issues being discussed in trade negotiations. And whilst we appreciate that Australia's uh, trade negotiators, uh, within the constraints of their mandate, uh, are able to share sort of general information, and, uh, and we have had many meetings with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in that uh, respect, and we appreciate those meetings, it's actually uh, invariably the case that Australia's position on key issues of interest to us uh, are just not there in terms of the detail. And that for us is extraordinarily frustrating uh, because of our inability to get access to the specific uh, text. And therefore, severely limits our ability to uh, raise issues uh, with, uh, with those um, people in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who, who try very hard. Uh, it severely limits our ability to raise issue with uh, members of parliament, with ministers, and so forth. The normal processes that we go through um, in many, many other uh, areas. And again and again, we've been assured that uh, the Australian government is pursuing the interests uh, of Australians and they'll not accept provisions that will uh, compromise the health system, for example, uh, for access to generic medicines. Uh, and the uh, government's reaction is sometimes, well, we're just scaremongers, scaremongers, um, trying to uh, um, cause some kind of problems. Uh, actually, we don't see ourselves that way. We actually see ourselves as a critical friend to government, uh, that we actually want to be able to work with government in the most effective uh, possible way to get the best outcomes uh, for the uh, for people of Australia and in our context in terms of, uh, of health, whether that is within the health system or outside the health system in areas that affect our health. And, uh, of course, we have... Uh, in amongst our membership, many people like uh, Dr. Gleeson, who um, are quite expert, who have significant expertise in these areas, hence we're able to produce the health impact uh, assessment. But our members always invariably come and say to us, "But the devil is in the detail," and uh, and making assessment uh, of things in a really accurate and appropriate way is extraordinarily uh, difficult. In many areas of the TPP negotiations, for example, the United States sets the agenda, tables texts, 
uh, and it's based on its own law, and you've heard some of that before. Uh, the US health system, of course, is characterised by high cost to consumers and low levels of access. It's, a, it's quite an anathema to Australians and to our, and to our own approach. Uh, the other area, I suppose, of frustration is that US corporations uh, and big worldwide corporations have privilege access to the text and strong influence over its content, while uh, ordinary Australians and, in fact, in industry members in Australia uh, do not have uh, that kind of, uh, of access, and we can provide details of the sorts of corporations, should you wish. Um, the interesting part is that the texts that have been leaked show that uh, it is heavily weighted to the interests of corporations rather than in the public interest, and that's not the way that uh, negotiations ought to be uh, in, uh, negotiated. The trade negotiations involve bargaining and health sector interests can often be traded off in exchange for wins in other areas, and that's simply unacceptable uh, to us. And in the end, uh, when the uh, uh, final things are presented, um, uh, senators, um, the parliament is going to have to make a decision on balance. Uh, what, do we, what do we accept? And we think that actually we're past that stage. We don't need to have such crude instruments uh, any more that, uh, that, in fact, uh, we need to ensure first the Australian public sees the text uh, at a time other than what happens now after it's been signed by Cabinet and it's either a yes or a no. Um, secondly, that since trade agreements have such wide-ranging impact on health and health equity in particular, uh, health impact assessments should be a mandatory part of what is, uh, what's happening. They should be independent. <coughs> Excuse me. They should be independent and the results made public. Currently, the consultation process, yes, we appreciate uh, we've, where we've been consulted, uh, but it's, it's very much ad hoc and it depends on organisations identifying and trying to understand uh, what's going on from leaked bits, bis, leaked, leaked bits of text. Um, so if the consultation is seriously going to be meaningful, then we have to have better access to understand uh, what is going on and, uh, and probably we'd be much more relaxed about accepting uh, assurances that, uh, that uh, public health, for example, is carved out as a, uh, as a separate uh, issue to be protected uh, from impact of uh, these things. And finally, uh, we need to ensure that uh, treaty text prioritises health in areas where health may conflict with trade goals. So a lot of work to be done in developing exemptions and safeguards that adequately protect public health. And the latest uh, leaked draft of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Investment Chapter suggests there is a long way to go and provides a clear indication that uh, TPP countries are not availing themselves of appropriate expertise be simply because the negotiations are so secret and, uh, and we uh, would like to see that changed. We thank the committee for the opportunity. Well, thank you for those um, opening remarks. Now, I've asked everybody who's uh, submitted today the same question. So we've been making these agreements for a very long time. Um, from your perspective, the Public Health Association, what is the biggest risk here and what is really brand new that's coming into these agreements that wasn't dealt with in previous uh, agreements? If you could sort of just put the two things to us. And your greatest fear, I suppose, is the PBS going to stay as it is? Well, we watch. We, there's certainly the issue of medicines, but uh, and uh, Dr. Gleeson will elaborate. But um, I think the uh, we know that in uh, public health, uh, that uh, the way we seek to save lives is not one by one as doctors do. And when you're on the receiving end, that's pretty important. We try and save lives by the millions because that's how we. That's actually what we operate: clean water, sanitation, immunisation. Um, so when we uh, are tackling one of the most significant issues of uh, health issues of our time, tobacco, uh, to watch uh, trade agreements be used by um, uh, um, international companies over our, uh, over our plain packaging of tobacco, and then to say, well, actually, you won't have to do that for the country um, challenging another country. You'll actually allow the investors uh, to do that. Now, so that's tobacco. And we're now facing two other major health issues in the same way, alcohol and obesity, and what are going to be the impacts of the trade agreements here. These can be handled. 
It's not that you can't do the trade agreements and look after these issues. You can. But we need to know that they're going to be dealt with, and, uh, and perhaps uh, Dr Gleeson can elaborate also on medicines. Thanks, Michael. Um, in terms of medicines, I think we've seen since the um, TRIPS agreement came into force in 1995, we've seen um, the United States and the EU push increasingly extreme intellectual property provisions through um, successive trade agreements. And I've um, analysed some of the text of previous agreements to show how, um, how the in successive agreements, um, they've gone further and further in terms of providing more rights to the pharmaceutical industry. And we've also seen the United States seeking to target um, pharmaceutical coverage programs like the PBS um, and in the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, Pharmac as well in New Zealand. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot, certainly a lot more to worry about in terms of um, in terms of the sorts of trade agreements that we're seeing now and the types of provisions that are being proposed for those trade agreements. And, um, and also, um, you know, there's a lot of concern in terms of an agreement that's being negotiated with the United States. Um, but it's not only the TPP that's of concern. As I mentioned, there are also a number of other um, trade agreements. The, the RCEP, which is the, um, the ASEAN countries plus the, the countries that have agreements with um, ASEAN. And um, so we're seeing kind of, uh, you know, some very big regional trade agreements comprising large um, you know, parts of the world's population, large fractions of global trade, large percentages of, of global GDP, where um, some of these uh, wealthy countries are able to advance agendas that are very pro-corporate and um, can really reduce access to medicines in large parts of the world. So. I think we heard someone earlier say that it's quite easy to quantify the extension of international intellectual property rights in pharmaceuticals. Is there any evidence that that happens in these agreements? Is there any evidence that well, that happens? Well, if they get extended by three years before you can get generics, does, does someone actually sit down and measure it? Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, but um, it's a possible thing to do in, in some areas. And I think. Um, uh, uh, Kimberly Weatherall mentioned before that the um, review of pharmaceutical patents that was done in 2012-2013 in looked at the cost of the patent term extensions that we already have in Australia and estimated that the, um, the cost uh, each year of those patent term extensions is around $240 million and in the longer term around $480 million. Um, there have been studies done of other trade agreements. Um, for example, um, in Jordan, uh, when Jordan signed up to the uh, WTO um, and an agreement with the US that had a very significant impact on the cost of medicines in Jordan and on people's access to medicines. And I can provide more information um, about the studies that have been done in Jordan, um, okay. if you'd you. like. Senator Wishworth. Next, Chair. Um, in relation to um, changes to IP laws around medicine, it's been put to me um, that the, the, the kind of changes that we're hearing about, at least through leaked text and, and other discussions, and take bi biologics as an example, um, that it's necessary for these patent extensions to give these pharmaceutical companies certainty over the pipeline of their, the delivery of their product. Uh, investment certainty. What, what's your what's your comments from from, from both of you on on that? Um, so the pharmaceutical industry in the U.S. is um, lobbying very hard for an extension on the data protection period, which is the period where um, manufacturers of, of follow-on drugs, competing products, can't use the clinical trial data um, that's used to register the initial version of the product. Um, so their argument is that, that you know, they need a longer monopoly period in order to be able to stimulate research and development. Um, but there are big questions about, you know, whether that, whether uh, providing longer monopolies actually leads to an increase of research and development. And actually there's quite a bit of, um, there's quite a big literature um, that's, that questions that assumption. 
Um, also, when there is more research and development done, it's often not directed towards the diseases that really need, you know, that people really need medicines for. Um, so often that research and development goes into slight modifications of existing drugs. Um, it goes into um, treating conditions like baldness, for example, rather than um, things that affect, uh, you know, most of the world's population. Is that because there's more money? Sorry to interrupt. Is that because there's more money in those kind of drugs? Presumably. Presumably. Yes. Okay. And cancer drugs mm -hmm. for uh, for first world, uh, you know, for the develop for the developed countries, um, as opposed to uh, newer drugs that uh, suit the uh, developing countries around issues like malaria or dengue fever or something like that. And it's not to say they're not doing those. Um, it's about the intensity and uh, and what they're trying to seek. By that. The other interesting element, I suppose, in looking at this issue is uh, um, the growing evidence uh, that actually the pharmaceutical companies actually spend more of their money on marketing than they do on research. Um, and in the end, uh, appropriately, they're a, a profit-based organisation. They have to deliver for their shareholders, um, and, and they're entitled to be that way. Uh, our role is to make sure that uh, we can... Uh, is, take whatever action we can as appropriate to ensure most equitable access to medicines, not just for Australians, uh, but also uh, remember that, uh, you know, Vietnam's involved in the TPPA uh, and, uh, and many other develop and these have ramifications for other um, developing countries uh, as well as the BRIC countries and so on. And have you, has either of your organisations provided direct feedback to DFAT? over recent negotiations on something like bio, biologics and extent, patent extensions? Have you gotten to that kind of detail? Um, I made a submission to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in December uh, mm -hmm. in my own right, um, looking at the amount of money that we spend on 10 expensive biologic drugs on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, which is around um, $1.3 billion. When there are um, follow-on versions of those drugs available, which are called biosimilars, um, if there had been um, follow-on versions available in the last financial year, they would have been subject to a 16% price cut and we would have saved $205 million. So that gives you an indication of the, the scale of the size of the amount of money that we would, um, the savings foregone if mm. we extend monopolies on those types of drugs. They're very large amounts of mm. money. All, all the profits back into the hands of the pharmaceutical yeah. uh, companies. Yeah. I understand the government, uh, Minister Robbs made com several public comments that the, no one will be worse off in terms of access to PBS, but that to me suggests that we just have to subsidise it through the taxpayer. Those, the, so essentially we're all worse off, but um, I'll let no doubt Senator Back will probably get into that with you in a minute. Um, could I just ask um, how important the Philip Morris case has been to your organisations in terms of getting getting active in, in, in this issue um, of, of investor state dispute settlement clauses? Yeah. Uh, I think that, um, that it's been quite extraordinarily helpful in the sense that uh, it's allowed our members to understand why it is that we're involved uh, in these issues. Uh, very early in the stage when Dr Gleeson approached me and said we should be doing this and explain why, that was fine. Uh, it wasn't so easy to explain that to, uh, to our members. They understand tobacco, they understand alcohol, they understand obesity very, very clearly, they understand the social determinants of health and equity. Uh, and so when, these, uh, so when we actually put these issues in those contexts, it was clear, and there have been some specific examples um, that I think are important as well. And uh, the labelling of a pregnancy warning label on alcohol in Thailand, wasn't it, um, was a, a good example. And, and it illustrates how these things work, because in fact there never was a, uh, it never went to the WTO. But Australia was one of the countries that put pressure on Thailand to remove those labels as a barrier to trade, <coughs> rather than letting it go further, they remove them. And yet, you know, pregnancy warning labels on alcohol seem to be pretty fundamental uh, to a normal value of health as just providing information. Um, and, it's, and it's a warning that ought to have existed. And I think it's uh, an embarrassment to us that we were involved in that way. 
Um, but more importantly, we, you then stand back from it and go, well, when we try and put pregnancy uh, warning labels on, uh, on alcohol in Australia, what's going to happen? Will there be an investor state dispute mechanism that's brought into place to prevent us uh, from uh, doing that? We'll take it a step further. Um, when a, uh, a, um, either a state or local government puts restrictions around alcohol trading, will there be an investor state dispute mechanism uh, brought into play to say, well, no, actually, uh, sorry, state government. Sorry, local government. You can't actually uh, do that. So, but have to be able to understand have, that, you have to have the text. Have you had those discussions, for example, with the minister or with DFAT around potential uh, carve outs, for example, or exceptions? Not that I necessarily believe yeah. they work, but yeah. you, you have. We have we have raised the issue certainly through uh, DFAT and have written to the minister with regard to uh, to uh, these uh, these issues uh, as well. Um, we do hear the reassurance. And you know that helps, um, and and I don't we don't for a minute think that they are done in in bad faith or anything. That's that's not the way we see it. It's actually about in the end how does the text work, and uh, and has and have independent eyes looked at that that text. Well, I'd, well, uh, well, sorry. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that that um, it's not intentions that matter in the end when a when a trade agreement's finalised. It's what's actually in the text. Um, and, and the binding obligations that that creates for countries. OK. Um, yeah. So in the back. Yeah, thanks. I, I pick on that same point. I mean, the, the minister, I guess I'll read the quote. PBS is an integral part of Australia's health system. The government will not agree to an outcome in the TPP negotiations which would adversely affect the PBS or Australia's health system more generally. Uh, that seems a fairly, uh, fairly unambiguous uh, statement to me. I know Minister Rob well, mm. uh, and uh, I wonder whether you don't have confidence in, uh, you know, in that in a statement as strong as that. Uh, look, let me let me start in saying that that is reassuring. That that's about the health system. I just talked about alcohol, which has nothing to do with the health system, uh, but actually has a very, very significant uh, um, role in health. I've been integrally involved in the development of the Health Star rating system on food. It's not going to be affected by a trade agreement the way it's set at the moment because it's voluntary. But had a, but had a government decided that actually they were going to use some compulsion to bring the last 30% of companies on place, then probably it would open it uh, up to those things. And so whilst I accept what, uh, what Minister Rob is saying in good faith and where he's coming from, it, the reason we want to see the detail, is, and the reason we think that the detail should be uh, open at this stage, is to uh, see how that applies across the spectrum, rather than within the narrow confines of, of the word health, mm. as, as he's used it. He may mean it the way we, uh, the way we take it. We'd think that'd be great. Mm. Uh, and that's why it is that we provided the health, you know, we went through the work in as far as it was possible to do the health impact assessment. So you've, uh, I noticed from the, the references that you've drawn also, you, uh, but, but you, you certainly have had the opportunity, and you, you, you have, as, uh, as an alliance, negotiated and, and had the opportunity to communicate actively with DFAT. Have you, yeah. uh, I mean, uh, to the extent that they've been able to share information with okay. you, have you uh, come upon any areas in which you, uh, at this stage, uh, you know, sort of have real concern that they are heading off in the wrong direction. Let me uh, let me put it in those terms. Yep. Um, there's a, a couple of issues in particular that we're very concerned about at the moment. One is the um, proposed increase of data protection for new uses of existing products and for biologic drugs. Mm. This is very much uh, still a live issue in the negotiations. It hasn't been decided yet. Mm. Um, it's likely to be, be decided in the very final stages. And we know that this is something that the US is pushing very hard for. And the pharmaceutical industry has singled this out as the most important issue that they want to see um, for their industry. Um, Sorry, can you just flesh that out? So if anybody's yeah. listening, what does that actually mean? <laughs> Sorry, what was what, that? What does that Data comment? protection. Well, what does it actually mean? Are they trying to expand the life of it, get more money for it? What, what does it actually mean? So there are, there are two different types of monopolies that medicines can get. One is the patent, which goes generally for a 20-year term and then in Australia can be extended for an, uh, up to another five years. 
Um, but there's also another type of monopoly, which is more, it's more of an absolute monopoly. So a patent can be challenged in court and can be revoked, um, but data protection can't be, be revoked. So that starts at the date of marketing approval, and it means that um, another company can't use the clinical trial data that the originator has used to register their product as, to prove that it's safe and effective. Um, so that it can be sold in Australia. Um, Can't use it ever. Um, for the time that it, at the time of that data protection period. So at the moment we have five years in Australia of data protection, and the US is proposing to add an additional three years for new uses of existing products, and um, a, a period of up to 12 years for biologic products. So even if a, a patent is revoked, um, that. Uh, we still not, may not be able to see biosimilar drugs, which are, are like generic drugs. And, um, and those um, trading positions, so to speak, are they based on increased costs of research to develop the drugs, or...? Um, they're based on the current exclusivity period in the US, which, interestingly enough, Obama is trying to wind back to seven years at the moment. Um, so it's interesting to see that they're pursuing um, a 12-year period in the TPP, and which sort of, you know, speaks to a bit of a, um, a, um, a, a split between, you know, those who are advocating for better health policy in, in the US and the um, office of the, the US Trade Representative, which there's kind of a bit of a divorce of, of policy in those areas. So it's just poor tra horse trading, basically. It's trading. They're trying to get the best they can for their... Just that I'm clear, if I can, on the data protection, and excuse my ignorance, it, it, it prevents somebody else using the data that the originating company has actually undertaken and collected. It doesn't stop another company from actually going and replicating the work and getting their own data, does it? And then registering or attempting to register. So it, doing, like doing those same clinical trials over again would be quite yes. unethical if they've already been done. Unethical? Unethical and very, very expensive Why would as they well. be unethical? Um, should you subject someone to um, participating in a clinical trial if the clinical trials have already been done for the safety and efficacy? Well, they were done the first time, so they must have been unethical the first time. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, the point is that uh, the first time, when you're doing the trial, you don't know what's going to happen. And so, especially if you're uh, um, using um, a placebo effect for some people and not, not for others, but then the second time, you actually know that the drug is very helpful, so you're going to subject somebody to a placebo effect, even though you know the drug would be helpful. That, that would be unethical. So someone with, well, you know with cancer... Well, dangerous to them, aren't you? So someone with cancer who goes into a clinical trial may get a placebo yes. when they could have actually had access the to the yeah. effective treatment. Mm. So that's the hold that the originating company has over. It's the, it's the well, I mean, as you say, there's a cost factor, but it's the ethical nature of the mm. argument. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Could I ask as a matter of interest on that, um, if in terms of a company having a monopoly on a certain type of drug, is there any price controls at all? Like, is, is there any way of policing those, the price of those drugs. Presumably they're set at a cost basis plus a margin. Is there, I mean, does it just, the company just dictate the price? Um, the company, I mean, I'm sure there'll be competition perhaps from other, other products maybe. The um, companies um, of the originated drugs um, go to the, apply to the PBS with yeah. a, a price that they, um, think, you know, is realistic for the, the drug. Mm. Um, and then the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee makes a recommendation about whether it's cost effective for listing on the PBS okay. at that price. And would it be different in America, presumably? Oh, look, I don't know very no, much okay. about the no, arrangements in America, but yes, it is different because there are multiple insurers rather than okay. a single buyer, a single, um, you know, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical mm. benefit scheme. Now, in terms of what you guys have got to do, you've got big jobs and big, big organisations with lots of members. In terms of what we're trying to achieve here today and find a process that's more efficient and represents all stakeholders, uh, if, if there'd been an initial process prior to something like the TPP, you, you know, and you'd been able to put in a submission or there'd been some sort of... Would it have made your life easier? 
Or it's, would it have been yeah, the same? I think actually more than making our life easier, mm. we would have been much more confident that we can be accurate about uh, about what we're saying. And uh, we have uh, 60 or so policies in the Public Health Association that are all evidence-based. We renew them every three years. So when we're actually using leaked documents to try and establish an evidence base, it, it's something we are quite uncomfortable with. Uh, on a cost-benefit analysis, we still think it's appropriate to, uh, to proceed. If we'd actually had the document that we're talking about, you know, phase one, phase two, these are the changes, phase three, then we, then we know what, uh, what we're talking about. And, uh, and perhaps even better, if a parliamentary committee was also examining it at the same time, uh, then uh, we're feeding through a, uh, a proper, what we would consider a, uh, a proper process. At least you wouldn't be called scaremongers, Chair. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Dr Gleeson and Professor Moore. And we will now move on to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade.